This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome again to this lecture on thermal unit operations. Last video we looked at the Fenske Underwood Gilliland method, the shortcut method, and we derived the equation of Fenske to determine the minimum number of theoretical stages for a given separation task. We know of course that there are other limiting values or other uh, things that are relevant to characterize distillation in limiting cases, and we know that the, especially the minimum reflux ratio is a very significant parameter and that is actually determined with the Underwood equa uh, equation. And then the Gilliland allows us to say something about, well, how the number of theoretical stages and reflux ratio, how they relate in a general case. So let's first have a look at the Underwood equation. So we want to determine the minimum number of theoretical stages. How is that done? Well, we know actually how it works from discussing the mccab diagram. And this is shown here. We know that we have, in general, the rectifying line, which has to run through xd on the diagonal. So this point on the diagonal xd at xd is one point of the rectifying line. The second point is characterized as the intersection with the y-axis as being at xd divided by v plus 1. The second line, which is shown here, is the intersection line which on the one hand side has to run through the diagonal again at xf and has an intersection with the x-axis as at xf over q. So these two lines intersect and we know actually that this is the point where also the stripping line has to run through. Now in order to determine the minimum, num uh, the minimum reflux ratio, we have to, well, what do we have to do? We have to decrease the reflux ratio, meaning that this point, this intersection point, will be moving up. That point of the rectifying line, that point up here, that remains at this point because at xd on the diagonal still is that point. So that point is moving up, so the rectifying line will be moving up, and the question is how far can we go? And we know, of course, we have derived that already in discussing the mccab diagram, and the limiting case is shown here. So the blue point now moved until the intersection of the two orange lines exactly falls on top of the green equilibrium curve. In that case, we reach an infinite number of theoretical stages where we know that this is linked with the minimum reflux ratio. And that's exactly what we want to do in the following. We want to determine this blue point, the intersection of the rectifying and the intersection line, and then plug the coordinates of that point, of that intersection point, into the equilibrium condition so that we actually determine the position of that blue point exactly on top of the equilibrium curve. And that way we determine the minimum reflux ratio. Of course we have to make certain assumptions with respect to the equilibrium. We want to assume again that the relative volatility is constant and want to plug that into or this corresponding equilibrium condition into uh, the equations. What does that mean? We have discussed that last time already. We know that if we have an ideal vapor liquid equilibrium, the relative volatility is actually the ratio of the pure component vapor pressures. And since now the temperature along the distillation column changes, this means that this ratio is temperature independent. So it's not just assuming ideal equilibrium, it's also assuming something about the temperature dependence of the vapor pressures. Well, actually, in order to evaluate the equation, in the end, we actually would need only the relative volatility at that point, in principle, but we also have to assume that we don't run into a tangent pinch. And for that, actually, we need to make the assumption that there is no tension pinch and that also in this region the relative volatility is constant so that we have a curve like this which does not show a point of inflection so that we don't have any danger of running into the tangent pinch situation. Okay, having said that, we can now set up the equations. Actually, we know the equations already. Well, how do they look like? Remember? On the one hand side we had the intersection line. 
And since we are interested here in the general case where the number of theoretical stages approaches infinity, I'll leave out the index for the theoretical stage. Also, we are dealing with a binary system, we know that. And for that case, also last time, we ignored the index of component 1 or the, of the component. And we always assume that we write it for, for component 1, which is the light boiling component. So with that simplification in notation, we can write the intersection line as y equals q divided by q minus 1 times x minus 1 divided by q minus 1 times xf. The second line we had to regard from the diagrams before is the rectifying line. The equation for that was, and you can look it up in, in your notes or in the videos if you like, the equation for that with the same simplifications with respect to indices is just the reflux ratio divided by v plus 1 times x plus 1 over v plus 1 times xd. And finally, we have to say something about the equilibrium. The equation we want to use, we have actually derived already in the last video. It was that the relative volatility equals y times 1 minus x divided by x times 1 minus y. And we want to assume that that is constant. Again, that this is constant means that we have ideal equilibrium, certain conditions on the temperature function of the vapor pressures and uh, it means that we neglect any situation where tangent pinch may become relevant. Okay, so, so now we have to combine these three equations. How do we want to do that? I actually mentioned that already. We first want to look where the intersection line and the rectifying line, where they intersect. So we link these two equations. Actually, what we will be doing in just a moment, we will subtract this equation from that because then the y cancels here, so we then have just 0 equals some function of x. We then solve for this x, which is then, of course, that x-coordinate of the intersection of these two lines. Then we plug this intersection x, the specific value of x, into this equation. That way obtain the y-coordinate of, y of the intersection point. We could plug it into this equation. The, the result should be identical if we didn't make any errors. Then we have the x and y of this intersection point between intersection line and rectifying line. And then we want to assume that that falls on top of the equilibrium. That means we plug these coordinates into the function for, of, of this equation for alpha and then obtain some lengthy equation. Alpha equals the function of those things that occur here. And of course, we know most of the things if you want to design a distillation column. We know xf, we know q, we have discussed that already. If you don't know any, those things about the feed, you are lost anyway. You, can't, do any, you can state, can't state anything. We have to know something about, like in the McCabe-Teal diagram, either two compositions, or two variables out of the four, xd, xb, d dot, or b dot, so the flow rates of distillate and bottom product. And the others can be determined from balances. So we, in the end, also know xd either because it's specified as a purity uh, requirement or it is resulting from the requirements that we have to gather with the balances. So we know that as well. And then we can solve for v, which in that case, of course, is then the v min, if you plug that into the equations. Okay, so let's do it. What did I say? I said, take this equation, subtract from that, left-hand side of the equal sign is zero. So 0 equals this minus that. These two have the x, so we can write x times and we put, can put the other things into brackets. This minus that. Okay, so v divided by v plus 1 minus q divided by q minus 1. And now come the absolute terms. This is a positive sign minus that, so that has a positive sign as well. So plus xd divided by v plus 1 plus xf divided by q minus 1. We can directly solve that for um, x 
Uh, well, actually, I should say, uh, I should first discuss that this x is now, of course, not a general x, but it's actually the x of the intersection because we have now connected these two equations. So that should actually be an xs that I want to use, that s index for the intersection point. So xs equals, and now we can bring these two on the other side of the equal sign, divide by the bracket, have to somehow take care of the minus sign. How do we want to do that? Well, first we write these two things uh, in a positive way. So it's xd divided by v plus 1 plus xf divided by q minus 1. And the minus sign we actually want to take care when dealing with that. So this is then negative. So this has a positive sign. That has a negative sign. So it's divided by q divided by q minus 1 minus v divided by v plus 1. And we can simplify that in two steps. On the one hand side, we can uh, multiply by the denominators. And what we obtain is xd times q minus 1 plus xf times v plus 1 divided by q times v plus 1 minus v times q minus 1. And if we deal with these things, we see that we have a qv here, a qv there positive negative sign, so they cancel, so we can say that the xs can be written as xd times q minus 1 plus xf times v plus 1, so that doesn't change, but the denominator changes and what remains is just q plus v. As mentioned, we want to take this xs and plug it into the equation for the intersection line. That way we obtain then the y at this xs, where the two, uh, well, this determines where the two lines meet, two straight lines meet. And if we plug that in either of the equations, we will get the corresponding y coordinate. And we use the q line for that, the intersection line. And that way, what do we obtain? Huh. What was the, were the coordinates? Of course, this is, this is then also the y of this intersection point, so ys equals. And now we just write down our equation. It's q divided by q minus 1 times x, x in general, in this case xs, of course, in this special coordinates, so times what we have just derived, xd times q minus 1 plus xf times v plus 1 divided by q plus v minus xf divided by q minus 1. This can also be simplified a little bit. ys equals xd times q times q minus 1 plus xf times v times q minus 1 divided by q plus v times q minus 1. That way we have now the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate of the intersection point between q-line or intersection line and rectifying line. These coordinates have now to co coincide with the equilibrium. So we have to plug these two equations into the equilibrium condition and that way we obtain of course an expression alpha equals something. Well, I don't want to go through all the uh, simple uh, math. Uh, I just want to show the result because I think that is fully sufficient in that case. You can try to plug it in yourself and try to wind up with this equation because that is the equation spelled out by Underwood. And this is an equation that in the end determines the minimum reflux ratio. What is the structure of this equation? Well, since we plugged x and y of the intersection point into the equilibrium condition, we obtain alpha equals something. And the something depends now on xd, xf and q, which are variables which we have to know. We have to know the feed. We also know the xd as spelled out before, either as a purity requirement or from some requirements for the distillation column and balances. And then the only remaining variable is the minimum reflux ratio. So if we know the equilibrium alpha, we are able to back out the v min from that equation. So this actually determines 
V-min in the end, because of course we have to know something about the equilibrium of the specific system that we are dealing with. So V-min can be determined. You cannot solve it for V-min directly because it's a little bit too complicated, so you would have to solve it iteratively, which is actually not a problem, even Excel can do that. If you pro program it properly, or you can do it simply with the Excel sheet and vary the V-min. Um, well, anyway, you are able to determine that from this equation. I should say something, though, about the alpha. So far I have said, well, we have to do certain assumptions, alpha being constant, but which alpha should it be if alpha is a function of composition, as is usually the case. Of course, since this more or less refers to a composition close to the feed composition, you would usually use the feed alpha, that at xf, for evaluating this equation. This will be more or less correct. So it's neither that at the top nor at the bottom of the distillation column, but rather that or at the feed that you should be using if you want to evaluate that equation. And if alpha is a strong function of the composition. So this has to be solved iteratively, but luckily for two typical cases, um, one actually being a relatively frequent one, one can simplify the equation and solve it directly for V-min. One case is that we have the feed at boiling liquid conditions. Q equals 1, you remember. At that point, Q equals 1, this is 0, that is 0. You realize that two terms directly cancel and these Qs are 1s directly, so everything simplifies and you can solve for V-min. This is the result. So there you can determine V-min directly. The other specific case is Q equals 0, which corresponds to the feed being vapor at dew point conditions, so also equilibrium conditions. Again, certain terms cancel, this term and that term cancel, and actually this uh, also simplifies, that is then just minus uh, 1, this one as well. So you can simplify the equation and solve it for V-min, and this is the result. So for these typical cases, and actually boiling liquid is a relatively frequent, or close to boiling liquid is a relatively frequent case, so you are able to determine the minimum reflux ratio relatively simply via this Underwood um, equation. Okay, so you are able from the definition of your separation task, knowing something about the system you want to separate, about the um, relative volatility, knowing your conditions of the feed and know something about XB, XD, we know, need to know that anyway already for the, for the Fenske equation, determining V-min. We are able to determine N-min and V-min, the minimum number of theoretical stages and the minimum reflux ratio. And we know that these are really limiting cases. You remember that diagram that we had, uh, a vertical axis, the N, a horizontal axis, the reflux ratio, and between we had some more or less hyperbolic curve. Now the question is, of course, where exactly is that hyperbolic curve located? And there Gilliland comes into play. Because he was very tricky, he must have been a really ingenious person, he looked into those uh, data that he got, and he found that if he doesn't just plot n versus v, but that if he plots n minus n min divided by n plus 1 versus v minus v min divided by v plus 1, essentially all Mekheptide results he obtained, so he performed several Mekheptide plots, and uh, what he found was that all his results, if you plot it this way, fall on top of more or less one line. This was 1940, so quite some time ago. Computers were not available at that time, not yet, yeah, it's still before the first Zuse computers or real electronical computer, so that was a uh, really, very, very long time. So he just did some Mekheptide diagrams and plotted his data. And actually the red points are read from his original publication in 1940. So these are his original data that he had obtained and he realized that, well, they lie plus minus on a single line. Okay, so that way we are able, of course, now to determine the relation between n and v, the number of theoretical stages and some chosen reflux ratio. We know, of course, the range for the reflux ratio. It should be somewhere between 1.05 and 1.5 times v-min. So possibly for a very, very first estimation, you would just assume it's 1.2 or something like that, according to your personal experience, possibly, times v-min. 
are able to solve that, get some value, say you find out it should be 0.4 and obtain then this value to be 0.3 and from that you can determine the number of theoretical stages. And then you have a design of the column because n determines the number of theoretical stages, determines the height of the column if you have chosen some specific type of column internals. The reflux ratio, well, it determines um, two things. On the one hand side, it determines the, well, first of all, it determines the internal flow rates. You have to know something about your distal flow rate from your balances, your specifications. You have to know that in advance from the overall balances and your specifications. With the reflux ratio, you then know something about your internal flow rates. And they tell you two things. On the one hand side, each type of distillation column internal has a maximum load, so a maximum uh, throughput. And so you have to design the, this, the diameter of the column such that the internals can cope with the flow rates. So actually, the reflux ratio determining the internal flow rates determines the diameter of the column so that the uh, internal flow rates can be um, treat, treated with the system or the, the internals chosen. So that way you know the diameter of the columns, you know, know the height and the diameter of the column, so you know your investment that is required to build that column. Secondly, if you know your internal flow rates, you can also say something about the reboiler duty as well as the condenser duty, so that way you know something about the operating cost. And that way you can perform really already a very first estimation of the cost of a product that you produce with such a distillation process. Well, now of course you can read from such a diagram, you can plot your data that you obtain from various column designs into that diagram and get more data points. So whenever you plot a McCaptile diagram, you want to evaluate that possibly and plug the data point into that diagram to get a certain idea about the variability of the spread of the data. But actually what you want to do, actually you want to have an equation that solves that. And for that there are some equations that have been proposed. In all of these equations the V minus V min divided by V plus 1 is abbreviated as capital X and N min minus N min divided by N plus 1 is abbreviated as the Y. So we are now having functions Y as a function of X corresponding to this Gilliland plot. The first one I want to show is that of Little 1968 and he split the overall range of x, which goes from 0 to 1, into three separate regions and correlated the data with some simple functions. The next equation proposed, so that I show here actually, is that of Molokanov, 1972, a single equation that you can evaluate. Looks a little bit complicated, but actually it's easy to program that in Excel, so you get some function for that. Next two are this by Edelier on, in 1975. Very simple function actually, um, so very nice to evaluate. On the other hand side, 1999 is one of the most recent ones by Rusche. Also some, it's a little bit more complex, the equation, but still easy to handle. So e, in each case you obtain y as a function of x. And now we can compare these uh, different functions with the original data from Gilliland. So the, now the black data are those from Gilliland and we can look at the results that we got. Actually in the meantime there are publications that have many more data points available and one sees that actually there's a significant scatter. So actually if you put all the data this scatters much more uh, broader than that uh, given here by Gilliland. But anyway we see that more or less all of the curves fall within the range of scatter of the data. Uh, we see that possibly the last one, Rusche, is a little bit too low uh, in the quite significant range here. There it lies more or less in the ballpark. So if you are in, in this range, which may be actually a quite frequent case, then you will find uh, pretty reasonable data. Uh, on the other hand side, one can see that the little equation, because that was split into three, three different regions, has some kink over here, which is not so nice. It doesn't, well, in the most of the cases, it doesn't really matter, because especially down here, you get some nice function, and, well, you have that kink, but who, who cares? Um, 
Then another problem is the so so the rush is a little bit too low here. The um, little is a little bit has this kink over here, and this Italy curve. Actually, if you look at the equation, the limiting case for uh, the x approaching zero, which means v approaches v min, does not correspond to the case where n um, approaches um, infinity. Because if well, we, we know of course. If v approaches v min, n should approach uh, infinity, so this ratio should actually approach unity because you have infinity minus n min divided by infinity plus 1, and that's more or less 1. So actually, as x approaches 0, y should approach unity. And the Intel G equation does not do that, it approaches 0.75, so it ends somewhere over here. It doesn't give that range in a proper way. That may not be so bad because you may not be in that region anyway, but nevertheless, possibly you would then, in, after all this discussion, use the Molokanov equation um, to evaluate that. Well, actually, as a good engineer, you have programmed all of them and evaluate the variability, and that way you get some idea of the accuracy of your correlation. And one should, of course, say for every single variable that you have determined with the FUG method, you have made significant assumptions. In determining Vmin, you made certain assumptions. In determining Nmin, you made certain assumptions. And actually, they are quite severe if you compare them for any real system. So actually, it doesn't matter which of these equations you take. You can take those that appears to me to be more suitable for you and evaluate that within the error of all the masses and this, even the scatter that you actually have in this diagram, you will get some reasonable results. And you should not expect that that is accurate and compare well with the final design of your column, but it gives you at least some first idea about investment and operating cost. Okay, having said that, let's summarize. We have seen now that with the Fenske underwood gilliland shortcut method, we are able to determine the minimum number of theoretical stages, the minimum reflux ratio, and get an idea of the number of theoretical stages required for the distillation task at hand as a function of the reflux ratio. Nevertheless, one should be cautious because shortcut methods require severe assumptions which need to be checked for each specific application. So whenever you perform a distillation design, this will be possibly the first thing you do, set up the fenske underwood gilliland correlation, get some first rough idea if distillation is a feasible process step in your overall uh, process that you want to design to de obtain a certain product in the end. But you know this is only a very, very, very first uh, approximation to the final distillation effort you need. The next steps then may be to really use a make up the diagram or even some more fancy methods, or even do uh, some numerical simulation with some uh, simulation software at hand. Nevertheless, it's quite valuable to be able to evaluate the amount or the effort that you need to perform a given separation task with such simple equations uh, to get this very first idea. And with that, I would like, le like to leave it at that. We have seen now the FUG shortcut method. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you again in the next video.